Your battles with the press as you were running for president were among the best we've seen. It was my own personal favorite of just your campaign. You went into the lion's den repeatedly and you were very good at it. And no matter how disdainful the interviewer, <laughs> you know, this is how we found them, you took them on, you stood your ground and out on the campaign trail, your critics would come and fight with you and you'd welcome them in. You'd say, come inside, let's have the debate. I wanna hear you. With the media, you knew how gross they are and you battled mm -hmm. them. We put together some highlights that we thought we'd take it down memory lane. Here, let's watch. Do you believe punctuality is a vestige of white supremacy, Dasha? Look, because if you, you don't, then you have a disagreement about many of the people who are defining those terms uh, or the written word or the use or the nuclear family. This is I, these aren't my words. These are the words of intellectual proponents from Ibram Kendi to the Ayanna Presley's to BLM that have said these are vestiges look, of white supremacy. So Mr. we Robert can't Bobby, have it both ways. Do, though, we have to have an choose, honest discussion. Great to replace a racist theory. Or a conspiracy theorist. It's a dog or, uh, yeah. so, what's, so, what's wrong with so, what's then, wrong with people? First of, of all, color let me just pause right there. Being a majority. Let, in this let me just pause right there. This is a legitimate discussion for us to have. In my views, I don't care about skin color. That language. They live like vermin. Do you believe that that is, as your uh, Republican colleague Chris Christie has said, neo-Nazi rhetoric? This is a classic mainstream media move. Pick some individual phrase of Donald Trump, focus on literally that word without actually interrogating the substance of what's at issue. The word if you are already black the skin and you live in this country, then you can disagree with me, but we're not. You mentioned that, you know, that I we disagree. have three different shades John, of melanin I think melanin we have to be able here. to talk about these issues in the open regardless of the color of our skin. Black Americans today, to say that, compare that to 1865 and 1964, I think you to compare absolutely it to 1865 and have equal rights so good. All right. So what did you learn, Vivek? Because you you were not a stranger to media before you ran for president. You'd been out there, but not in this way, you know, contentious exchange after consent, contentious exchange. So what, how do you view the media now having been through that washing cycle? So I actually learned to draw a really important distinction, Megan, and you alluded to it where sometimes you'll go to college campus and you'll have somebody who asks a question from the audience or even not a college campus elsewhere who earnestly disagrees with you, maybe even a protester at an event. I view that as largely in a different category from the so-called disagreements you get from much of the mainstream media, because one of those is earnest and the other of those is cynical. And so the way I think to deal with earnest disagreement is to actually engage your opponent, to give them a chance to speak as long as you get to be heard in return and actually try to change minds. At the very early stages of the campaign, I wrongly approached my interactions with the media with that same assumption of good faith. Probably mm -hmm. one thing I would do differently over the course of this campaign, if I were to do it again, is there's all these times you would spend having relationship building or off the record conversations with the person on the other side, treating them as though they're a human being. And many of them maybe individually are, but they're still in organizations that then won't print the kind of reporting that they otherwise are beholden to do. That was a mistake. And so I quickly learned that over the course of the campaign. If you're dealing with a good faith actor who disagrees with you, the right answer is not to shut them down, but to give them the space to actually speak even when they disagree. By contrast, 99 out of 100 times, when you're dealing with the mainstream press, especially covering someone like a presidential candidate, you have to throw that assumption of a good faith assumption out the door and understand that everything they do is designed to achieve a cynical portrayal of either you or what you stand for, because that's their job. That's their function. That's what their bosses and their organizations and their incentive structures reward. And once you see it that way, you're able to actually smoke that out for the public to see. And mm -hmm. I think once the public sees it, that itself is a, I don't mean to be self-important about this, about me or anybody else doing it, that itself is a form of public service right now, revealing yeah. and holding the media accountable. Because the media is supposed to hold the government accountable. When the media fails to do that, the real question is who's holding the media accountable? And it comes back around, I think, to political candidates who were able to see through that smoke screen and call it out. And I tried to do the best job of that I could, especially in that latter half of the campaign. Well, it was very interesting to watch because you went everywhere and did battle, as I say, in the lion's den. DeSantis did something else. He said, we're not dealing with these people. They're not honest brokers. I'm not, I'm not even going to deal with them until his campaign was really flailing. And then he said, OK, I'll go everywhere. I'll, I'll try it. And kind of went back to the DeSantis we saw during COVID, where he was much more pugilistic. He would engage. And but it was too late. So we know that to pugilistic, that would be a fair term for Donald Trump. 
Um, so what does he do with this media that you and I are describing from this point forward? I mean, I've never seen a media so dedicated to defeating a candidate. I mean, they, notwithstanding their own self-interest, yeah. they know their numbers are gonna go up if he wins. They are going to do their level best to ruin him over the next nine months. So what would you advise him to do now? I'd say stay the course, because at this point, especially in the media's relationship with Donald Trump, the people of this country have seen through the act for what it is. And so in some ways, the more that mainstream press, especially against the backdrop of these politicized prosecutions, is unfairly depicting Trump, I think people have now been trained to see through it. I don't think people are sheep, not forever, at least, Megan. And so in 2015, that might have been one thing. I think today, I think most people understand, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me and understand a lot of what they've been fed about the Russia collusion hoax was a lie. The next lie they're fed, they're not going to be force fed that and swallowing quite as easily. They see through these prosecutions. I mean, look at the likes of Alvin Bragg or Fannie Willis or the likes of, you know, even just the other prosecutors who are bringing these cases. These aren't the luminaries who we once thought they were no. presented to be. Letitia James. I mean, think about just Fannie Willis, Letitia James, Alvin Bragg. You hear these people actually speak and make their case or look at the history of what they've said and then look at the way they're bringing these cases against Trump. I think people are able to see for themselves and draw their own conclusions what's behind this. And the same goes for the media's prosecution of Trump as well. And so my advice would be don't really fall for the bait of falling, in, falling into the trap of airing the grievance against the media, because I think people already have that native grievance for themselves of having been duped once eight years ago by a press that lied to them. And again, even four years ago, that suppressed stories that they were told were false. Russian disinformation, like the Hunter Biden laptop story, or the fact that COVID or the origin was actually in a lab in China. People have been lied to enough that I think people have a good sixth sense now, much, much of our electorate does, to see that if that media is actually going after Trump with that agenda driven of an angle, in some ways it has a reactionary backlash that could cause many independents to actually run to Trump rather than away from him. And so I think in that sense, at least, he's gonna be in a good spot. Mm -hmm. It's already happening. So how about you? You were very, very busy over the past year and a half. I mean, you, yes. <laughs> you were running for president. You were everywhere. You went to every event. You spoke so many different places. You were doing a podcast at the same time. You still have your companies. Your family man, I, like, I'm exhausted just thinking about it, Vivek. I honestly, I can't. I can't. So now it's somewhat the calm after the storm. I know you're out there stumping for Trump and, you know, talking to him and his team, but it's got to be, you know, instead of zero to 60, 60 to maybe 30. So how's that feeling for you? What, what does life look like now? So I'm, I'm not natural in this, in this new temporary habitat I've been in the last six weeks, but I have really enjoyed a lot of time taken with the family, maybe making up if I'm being honest with it for, I think, especially yeah. in the late part of last year, my kids are young and we don't get that time forever. And so now I'm doubling down and really making sure that we're, we're getting the extra time that we might have missed in, in December and January. But I am enjoying that and relishing that for what it is. Look, a lot is going to depend on what happens in the next 10 months. I'm intensely focused on making sure Donald Trump is elected decisively as the next president. I'm doing whatever I can to be helpful on that front. And I hope to be involved in whatever future that entails in the next administration. But I think we can't take that for granted. I've also learned over the course of my life, politics aside, Megan, that whenever I have made elaborate personal plans for myself, and I've lived in phases of my life where I've done this, you know, okay, if thing X goes this way, then I'm going to do that. If not, I'm going to do this. It never works out according to that plan anyway. Mm -hmm. Most of your plans are stupid, or at least most of mine have been stupid when it comes to long-term life planning. And so, you know, I'm at my best where I'm called by a sense of purpose and the same purpose that led me to run for president, which is my level of care and love of this country and gratitude to this country, right? I'm not in a phase of my life where I need to accumulate more things for myself. To the contrary, this country has allowed my wife and I both independently and together to have lived an American dream that either of our parents would have never imagined when they came to this country. That's what called me to run for president to have the biggest possible impact that I could by using the gifts that I've been given. The people of this country made a clear decision that it's going to be Donald Trump leading the Republican Party to do that next. But whatever I do next, I think is going to still be guided by that same purpose. And to tell you the truth, whatever specific form it takes, I'm open to that inside government, be that after Trump's reelected and be it outside government in the meantime, even this next year, there's a lot of impact to be had. And so 
I started Strive a few years ago. I'm proud of everything that Strive has accomplished. I have you know, written a number of books. I enjoy writing. Maybe I'll write another one, even if it's not published, even if it's just for me. Writing is something that helps me, I think, anchor what my actual convictions are. And spending time with family, that's going to be plenty for a number of months ahead. Let's discuss a crucial aspect of your financial health, your credit report. It's time to face a hard truth. Your credit report could be suffering due to unfounded reputation damaging claims. These are the kind of claims that simply will not hold up under rigorous scrutiny. And that's where Lexington Law Firm comes into play. For less than a hundred bucks, Lexington Law champions your cause using a comprehensive arsenal of consumer protection laws to fight for your best credit report. Lexington Law is fully equipped to challenge those exploitative creditors who also work with the aggressive debt collectors, and they obstruct your financial path and future. Go and visit LexingtonLaw.com for a complimentary credit assessment. Let their experts place your credit under the microscope, ensuring it reflects your true financial story. Remember to mention that Megan referred you. Again, that's LexingtonLaw.com. Empower yourself with the right team on your side. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.